Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and good day. Greetings from Malawi's capital city, the long way, or Mulibwanji, we would say. My name is Rachel Etta Poya, and with the Tax Justice Network, I am senior researcher. Friends, comrades, activists, researchers, and those in between, it's my great pleasure to welcome you from my screen for this treat of the Tax Justice Annual Lecture, the indefatigable Global Alliance for Tax Justice Executive Coordinator. He's taking his virtual podium as speaker, a man known for standing up with and for those perceived as weaker. To the tax justice movement, he has been pivotal and his position has remained unequivocal on the injustices heaped generationally upon the global south and on those who bind both the hands and mouth of those people, groups and countries most marginalized, he stands to resist and overhaul systems to realize rights for all and to flip the unjust, often racist scripts. And those who know him well tell me he quips about the way powerful countries their greed, wealth and position enable. He says, if you haven't a seat at the table, you are probably on the menu. And with this, the rich continue with their neo-colonial plunder. And you may begin to wonder what led this activist on his journey. And tonight he will share from his life story. First, as an aside about this rhyme, I thought you might need a break from prose at this time, although the team working on translation may not exactly enjoy this oration. Yet, as I'm in charge of hosting the annual lecture of 2021, I didn't run this past my boss, Tax Justice Network CEO, Alex Cobham. So if you suddenly see me disconnected, you know the style has been entirely rejected. But back to the great privilege I have, and I hope now I do not gasp. Let me continue to share some of what I know because I'm going quite well with this flow. Marxist Leninist political activism in his youth was a bit too much like the truth. So he has led a life in extended exile where in word and deed he continues to rile the powerful who rig the economic and political system. And though he may no longer wait with bated breath for the revolution, he abhors domination, especially by transnational capital and stand with those who need existing structures to fall. He is an unrepentant internationalist and believes those oppressed must themselves resist the structures of power and narration that stand in the way of liberation. He continues to cajole people like you and me for the way we are biased through the lenses we see. In the 80s, PhD in hand, he lectured at the Free University in Berlin and thereafter with Christian aid did he begin as country manager for East Africa and then senior economic justice advisor tackling economic socioethnic inequalities with flair for the Tax Justice Network Africa, he was a founding chair, seeing shifting power and amplifying voice important for Africa if countries are to have agency and choice over their destiny and economic, political and financial structures. And this he continues through the Global Alliance for Tax Justice. Under his guidance, this fire starting alliance was nominated this year for, with the ICIJ for the Nobel Peace Prize. He is a unifying figure for many regional movements and through these tax justice roles, he has spent time calling out the self-interested rich countries as they design tax systems at the OECD, where many global South stakeholders are treated like an afterthought. But you remember what he said, you are caught not at the table by those enabled. Instead, you are on the menu, denuded of your intrinsic value. Give him a match and with it, he will light the thatch of those straw houses for straw men. And yes, mainly men who say tax incentives are needed for foreign direct investment or who are intent on maintaining the status quo or just tweaking the system. So the 131 countries reluctantly say, yes, this is the way we will go. Give him a match and he will light the way for marginalized people and countries to take flight not like finance and capital, which shifted offshore means that realizing rights for all countries to stall continues to stall. Today, he will talk to you about the entire financial system as an aberration and how these revelations are connected to your, my, our liberation. This may not sit well with you, but through his challenge and call for change, I hope you will stew. He may call you, me, us out for the biased institutions, blinded research, unrooted ideas or unhelpful things about tax justice we spout. And yes, he will light a match to open your eyes of where we have come from and the way we must rise. With much, without much more rhyme or your time or ado, join me in welcoming Dr. Derege Alameu. Thank you. Thank. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, I was, I was uh, almost not nervous when I was preparing, but now you made me nervous by this phrase. <laughs> and thank you. And uh, 
I'm sure I'll be, you'll be the one I will disappoint because it was, I was just putting together some ideas. But thank you very much for the kind words at any rate. So, uh, uh, as you as Rachel indicated, I'm not a tax expert. Uh, I'm a tax justice activist. So it will be pretentious for me to call this a lecture. I would like to present it as a reflection of a tax justice activist from the global south. <clears throat> I have uh, three uh, main topics uh, in this in this intervention. The first one is about the tension between tax expertise and tax justice, some anecdotes from the early years. <clears throat> the second one would be about the four R's uh, as regards their contribution to our campaign and advocacy so far, and how to make them more relevant and useful in the future. Uh, and the last part will be about some suggestions related to our future work in policy analysis. The tension between tax expertise and tax justice, just uh, some anecdotes from the early years. There are tax experts, tax experts servicing the business sector and tax experts serving the tax justice movement. But there are no tax justice experts. Tax is essentially technical, tax justice is primarily political. Tax justice struggles belong to the political sphere. It is only in the political sphere that tax justice and human rights could be linked, and the struggles for tax justice and human rights could be aligned. The dis this distinction is very important. The lack of clarity on this has been a major source of misunderstanding and, at times, acrimonious disagreements in the past. When the creation of Tax Justice Network Africa was announced at the then Tax Justice Network Global Board call, one of the attending tax experts asked, how can that be? There are no tax experts there. During the first few years after the creation of Tax Justice Network Africa, we were warned not to speak on behalf of the tax justice movement because our lack of expertise in tax matters would be a reputational risk for the movement. Still around this time, at the Tax Justice Network Global Council meeting during the World Social Forum in Dakar, Sandra, one of our colleagues at Tax Justice Network Africa then, suggested the translation of introductory TGN publications into vernacular African language. One of the leading figures that said, I don't give a damn about village in the middle of nowhere. There is an interesting parallel to this. Of all places also in Dakar, in a speech delivered at Diop, Diop University, Sarkozy stated that l'Afrique n'est pas encore entrée dans l'histoire. Africa has not yet entered history. It seems some of the experts then considered themselves as the Dimitrovs of the Tax Justice International, entitled to give marching orders to their followers elsewhere. They did not succeed to discourage us. They may have tarnished their deserved recognition and their own invaluable contribution. My anecdotes are not from personal exchange, but from publicly made statements at meetings especially the last anecdote remains in the fresh memory of those of us who were at the meeting. We had respect for expertise, recognition for contributions to the tax justice movement, but only contempt for paternalism and pity for bloated ego, which always underlie paternalism. I wanted to, to raise this, not so much to say the accounts or to open old wounds. We have moved on. The divorce process was acrimonious and painful, but the divorce itself was amicable and unanimously agreed arrangement. <clears throat> I raise this because the tension between tax expertise and tax justice activism will always be there. Sol Picciotto has referred to this in his inaugural lecture to this conference two years ago. It cannot be resolved. It has to remain a point of permanent dialogue. One example to close this topic. I have not read, nor am I planning to read, the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. I am grateful 
to tax experts in our movement for teaching me why these guidelines are flawed and how they facilitate profit shifting. But whether it is the OECD or the UN, which has the mandate and legitimacy to fix broken and outdated international tax rules, this has less to do with tax expertise and more to do with politics and power relations on the international arena. My position on this is dictated by my political conviction. Whatever some tax experts may say, I reject the tutelage of former colonial powers. A good, act, a good approach to, to is to acknowledge and consciously manage the tension and remain in dialogue for this. The dialogue should be based on mutual respect and solidarity. It should be about understanding the policy position of activists, not to impose policies. The dialogue could also be perceived as negotiating a division of roles and tasks. Now I'll go to the second point, the four R's, their contribution in our campaigns and advocacy, and how to make them more relevant and useful in the future. The four R's, R's encapsulate the main message of tax justice. As such, they helped us to overcome the widespread belief that tax is a technical issue to be left to experts. They served as advocacy vehicle to bring tax justice issues into public policy debate and raise interest in national and international policy agenda, which also meant changing the narrative and perspectives regarding tax. However, the four us don't question the fundamentals of capitalism. Their underpinning theory is within the functions of the state tenets of mainstream economies. If the aims of the tax justice movement are not limited to giving capitalism a human face, the limitations of the, the four R's in terms of overcoming capitalism need to be recognized. Their content needs to be continuously developed to make them building close of capitalism critique. I'll just have some points about, uh, for, about each of them. Revenue, this seems straightforward. But as one of the four us, it has helped us clarify not to take tax simply as a tool for raising revenue or simply to increasing the tax GDP ratio. In particular in Africa, where budget allocation and budget transparency were the focus of CSO, it helped, that, it helped us raise the issue of the overall size of the national pie. That it could be bigger if this and that happens in tax policy to raise the importance of resource leakages in different forms that lessen the size of the national pie, to highlight the detrimental impact of foregone and forsaken revenue, about the impact of regressive versus progressive taxation on inequality and development, and development outcomes more broadly. I don't think... <clears throat> Okay, let me skip this. Uh, redistribution. Critical political economy makes a distinction between primary distri distribution of the source of income and secondary distribution. The structures that create and per perpetuate inequality are already determined in the production sphere at the primary distribution. Uh, primary distribution creates and reproduces the haves and the have not structure. The distribution in the four us in the four us refers to secondary distribution, the allocation of revenue to address different forms of gross inequalities. Should the tax justice movement be content with fair secondary distribution? In other words, accept that sanctity of private ownership of the means of production, or also put in question the primary distribution, which makes unbridled competition to profit maximization, the organizing principle of the economy and society. No socialism is not a solution, but criticizing the functional logic of capitalism to inform the struggle to reform capitalism itself is very important. After accepting the invitation from Liz to speak at this conference, I boastfully threatened my friend Alex that my so-called lecture will be a 21st century version of the Communist Manifesto. So let me at least quote Marx's words. But first, Proudhon. I quote Proudhon. Uh, 
if I were asked to answer the following question, what is slavery? And I should answer it in one word. It is murder. My meaning would be understood at once. No extended argument would be required to show that the power to remove a man's mind, will, and personality is the power of life and death, and that it makes a man a, a slave. It is murder. Why then to this other question, what is property? May I not likewise answer it is robbery without the certainty of, the certainty of being misunderstood. The second proposition being no other than a transformation of the first. Now to my marks. You are horrified at our intending, uh, I'm quoting, you are horrified at our intending to do away with private property. But in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. Its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those nine tens. You reproach us, therefore, with intending to do away with a form of property, the necessary condition for whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. In one word, you reproach us with intending to do away with your property. Precisely so. That is just what we intend. End of quotation. Repricing. The elaboration of this was mostly limited to syntaxes. However, this is a key R, a key of one of the four, a key of, uh, among the four R's, and we should not limit it to this. Repricing could be a very important tool to prevent or reduce externalization of costs, given the social, that socialization of costs and privatization of benefits is the hallmark of capitalism since the beginning. Representation. <clears throat> it was mainly used as, as a historical and theoretical postulate within the context of accountable governance or social contract discourse. But it should mean more than that. It should include citizens' involvement in tax policy processes. In other words, that should not be a technical issue at the margin of national policy making. Representation should also include making tax policy part of a political project which determine political outcomes of election processes. A victory of a party with austerity and tax cuts for the rich in, the, in its program is our defeat. <clears throat> now I come to the last part, uh, some suggestions related to the future of the future work uh, in terms of uh, policy analysis. Anchoring tax justice in critical political economy is very important. Most publications in the tax justice movement often point at the lobbies, lack of ethos of accountants and bankers, et cetera, as drivers of tax abuse. This is too shallow. Critical political economy could help us link tax with the functional logic of capitalism and to figure out the political economy determinants of tax policy and tax abuse. Tax abuse is not an aberration in the system. The system itself is an aberration. I know referring to Marx even among progressives is anachronism, almost a taboo. Marx's works, when taken as the blueprint for the future, have been abused and misused by Putschist Lenin, dictator Stalin, and Chinese nationalist Mao. However, blaming him for these abuses is like blaming Christ for the Inquisition. Tax justice has a lot to learn from Marx as a critic of real and existing capitalism. His major works were not blueprints of the future, but critics of the existing capitalism. Just another quote to end this. Capitalist production, therefore, I'm quoting from Marx, capitalist production is therefore only develops the techniques and the degree of combination of the social process of production by simultaneously undermining the original source of all wealth, that is nature and the worker. <clears throat> Second, the aspiration of tax justice should not be limited to changing tax rules. It should aspire to be a, common, a component part of the struggle to change systems and structures and power relations that reproduce 
multidimensional inequality and injustices in all spheres of society. After all, tax dodging is not the only mischief perpetrated by corporations. As an extension of this, the, the ambition of tax justice should not be limited to bringing about policy shift in tax policy. Tax policy is not a niche issue. It is part and parcel of social and economic policies. The ambition should be to contribute to a paradigm shift as regards how social economic life of society is organized. In other words, it should be about defeating the predominant neoliberal paradigm. The role, uh, another point, the role of the state enabling tax abuse and pursuing tax policies that make the rich richer and the poor poorer should be the, at the center of the advocacy and awareness raising activities of the tax justice movement. Tax, should, tax justice should ultimately be perceived as a struggle against corporatocracy. In its global ambition, the aim of tax justice could not be limited to bringing technical solutions to transfer pricing abuse. The notion that the institutional arrangement does not matter as long as the outcome brings a few percentage more revenue to poor countries is not just is not a justice-based notion. In institutional arrangement for in international negotiations matter. Transparency and equality in the process matter. Ensuring that the reform process itself takes place within the legitimate institution with universal membership and ensuring global governance as an inclusive and transparent governance is very important. Finally, the, tax, the task in the tax justice movement as regards the realization of human rights is not mainstreaming human rights within itself. It is about creating an organic link and alignment with human rights movements and other struggles for justice. To create convergence of all movements to change systems, structures, and power relations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Derege, for the, the challenging um, call for the, our future as a tax justice movement. Um, as people are, um, and I would encourage you to, um, people who will be watching this, to, bring it, to join in on the chat and, and um, ask some questions. But let, let's kick this off sort of um, where you ended, really. And you, are, I mean, let's cut to the chase. So, the African Tax Administrators Forum responded last week to the inclusive framework statement on the two pillar solution. And in it, they said, and I quote here, if the process is to produce an equitable outcome, it will be important that developed countries do not exert political pressure on developing countries. So are we at the table? Are we on, are we on the menu? Are we somewhere in between? And what do we do as a movement um, with, the, with the current political economy of international tax? Uh, okay, uh, the, the first is really, I'm more worried about some tolerance and acceptance I hear from around the tax justice movement. Uh, I will not call a person uh, in the name, but in a meeting I heard, developing countries do not know what they want to do. So it is already a good thing if, if the G20 or the rich countries do something that gives them some benefits. So with this approach, we are uh, creating a situation or accepting a situation which, is, uh, which predates democracy itself. That means, uh, you know, early uh, the 19th century up to the beginning of the 20th century, voting rights were limited to those who have property. Because the argument was they are the ones who know the issue and who can also vote responsibly. The plebeians, those without property, the poor ones, do not know what they want, so they will just 
create chaos. It is only if you follow this logic that you accept a situation where powerful countries are the ones who should decide on how international tax rules and regulations are uh, uh, to be changed and to be to be <coughs> to be reformed. If you look at this process, uh, they say there is tax expertise in, in the in, in the OECD, but no expertise in the UN. Whether you whether you end uh, a climate science expert expertise institution when it facilitated a, a global intergovernmental uh, climate justice agreement, or did it pull the expertise of other institutions and other uh, you know uh, others to pull them together and bring it into a United Nations process, an open process, that so that it can be negotiated. The second one is. We had the draft of the negotiation document. We have, as citizens, the possibility of A, influencing the final outcome, and B, influencing and holding to account our government for the positions they take in this process. It is not about, it is, it is also about our own right as citizens to influence outcome of our negotiations. You do it behind the behind closed doors. The rich ones meet at, at a summit level as heads of state to decide on something. Poor countries are invited to send technical delegates, which are put under pressure to accept uh, whatever is manipulated. So this is this is a system. Even if the technical outcome can be this and that, the process itself is objectionable. It is, it, is, it is a situation which creates a feudal structure in which the rich ones decide and the poor ones have, have nothing but to follow. So uh, the second one is this. The second one is when there is informal consultation on, where, on the blueprint or whatever, we always find critical positions from developing countries, either as a group or individually the G24, ATAF itself, when the manipulative OECD secretariat sub submits a synthesis, you see that they have been in a Bermuda Triangle. They disappear. They are not even considered. For example, so it is, uh, the third one is, I think, most people think, consider this also as part of this development aid logic, helping poor countries. This is not about development aid. It is not about, you know, development aid is a voluntary thing you do. You are not forced to do it. It is just what you do voluntarily. Developing countries are not entitled to development aid. It is a voluntary action, whether it is philanthropic or has other interests behind it, that is not even relevant. So they have all the right to, to, to develop their own development policy. They have the right to, to use the OECD uh, as, a, as, a, as an institution that coordinates their development policy because it is their money, it is their voluntary. But this is now a right. It is about the right of developing countries to tax part of global profit, which emanates in their economies. It is about the right of sovereign nations to tax. This cannot be done on the basis of this aid logic. So, uh, <clears throat> so the, it, is, it is this which is for me disappointing. When, when, when some, even within the movement, start saying it is a technical issue, the UN is, but who is making the UN, who is marginalizing the UN? You sabotage the UN to make it weak and say, my organization is strong, it can fix it. This is not fair. So as I said, the, Uni the United Nations does not need to have the technical expertise. Is the UN uh, an institution of expertise in, in, in statistics, but it is accepted that it, it is hosted and regulated. The regulatory frameworks are hosted by the United Nations. The climate conference are hosted by the United Nations. So an open process in which countries equally participate is very important. So 
We should not look at the percentage additions that it might bring in terms of revenue. We should look at, at the right of sovereign nations to determine uh, their tax policy and also at the legitimate right of the United Nations as an inclusive universal organization to be the only institution that can process an intergovernmental process, uh, negotiation to sort out, uh, to, to fix the broken international tax system. Thank you, Derrida. And on the point you've just finished on around the, the, the role and the place of the UN in transforming and uh, the international tax architecture, I have a question from Alex Coburn who says, um, thanks for such a challenging lecture and question back to you. Given that tax and justice is system, system, systemically embedded and that power imbalances are prevalent at the UN as ever, anywhere else, and as you were talking about in your lecture about the importance of us in the, as activists um, applying critical political economy analysis, how does a tax justice movement change the fundamental dynamics even at, with the power imbalances at the UN in order to force progress now on reform? So uh, there are there are uh, two level engagements. Uh, that is, uh, why is a UN a UN process relevant for us in tax justice? It is because of the possibility of mobilizing a, clo a global public, a global mass movement, to influence global processes. We are not yet there, but my my imagination or my wish is to go where the climate justice movement has gone. It is, uh, so it is because it, it affects everybody, maybe to different and varying degrees, but the issues, you know, the issues are interconnected, uh, tax, tax dodging, tax abuse, hurts uh, the working families in, in developed and developing countries together. It is, it is a connecting issue for the whole, uh, for, for the for for the global public. So one is this mobilizing factor is very important to 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 bring back the UN into its role. So the possibility of connecting national level struggles to make a national a global movement out of them, just like the climate justice movement has succeeded to in, in becoming a global movement. That is one. The second one is uh, uh, no matter whether they are repressive, uh, a band of thieves or what, developing, developing country governments are our allies in this endeavor. Because they are at least at the level of the United Nations, they are defending the interests of developing countries. So the second level of our engagement should be forging alliances with developing countries who are at least in favor of changing the structures uh, and, and bringing back the UN to its to its to its, uh, to its uh, legitimate role. So we have to do this on, on on two levels. One is the public mobilization of global citizens for this, and the second one is forging alliances and collaboration with developing countries. For example, now uh, there is a, a solitary a solitary. Uh, There is the uh, there is an ATAF statement. It says that's a, that's a point I wanted to raise. There is an ATAF statement that says there is political pressure on us, on, on developing countries. Right? So the third task is, especially for those parts of the movement who are in the north, it is about also challenging their own government to stop intervention. In an obscure, uh, in, a, in, a, in an opaque process, to, to stop putting pressure on, on on countries and come to the open, support a UN process, because those who are blocking it are the, the rich countries. We know them. So the tax justice movement in the north has the additional task of at least breaking the sol solid resistance of rich countries, ganging up uh, to make the the OECD the venue for tax norm setting and to weaken the UN. So mobilizing the global public in support and, and collaboration with developing country governments, the delegations, and breaking this 
solid alliance of OECD countries to block the system, uh, at the, uh, to block the, the process in the United Nations. These are the three main things I see for my, as, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much, Derek. I'm just I'm going to take some questions from people uh, in our audience. So um, from Anders Arrows, we had he asked if we tax justice campaigners from the south were to expropriate one or two gatekeeper entities or institutions that respond to transnational capital or financial capital and make them public goods open and fully democratic, what would they be? Swift company registers, the FATCA database, the oil companies ledgers. What do you think, Derek? Uh, very, very difficult question anyway, and I'm not really, I don't feel uh, competent enough to, to discuss a, a national level issue. But uh, there, there, is, there is one thing in general, where, the way I envisage change. Uh, anything that is happening, in a, as I refer to, in a Leninist, Putschist manner is, is, is a, a, an oral vision for me. But if tax justice activists manage to make, to make their demands part of a social project, a policy project that, is, that has the majority of the citizens in that country, that should be the aspiration. It's not about putting this uh, on the agenda or, or pushing this change, but it is to envisage it as a policy and as a political and social project that will win the majority of citizens in a, given, in a given country. So if that is achieved, then that is what I can say. That is, if, it is, if it happens within this perspective of making this an alternative model of economic organization, a majority project, and it succeeds, then I think that the rest, the rest, is, the rest is easier. The, 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 the biggest challenge is, uh, you know, that, that, that is maybe what led others to do putsch uh, in the name of socialism. It's because it is very difficult to get a social majority for a project. So, but there is no alternative to this. So uh, the long-term struggle should always be envisaged as a political project that will get a solid social majority for its implementation. So, uh, it's not about nationalizing this or that company. It is really about changing how economy and society organize and how this organization wins the majority of citizens in a given country. Thank you for that answer, Jerry Jane. It, it links to another question we have from Sergio Chaparro, who um, is asking about how human rights activists are organizing. And, um, what's your take on how human right, the human rights movement is doing in incorporating tax justice as a key dimension in the struggle for human rights? Uh, really, the, uh, I, I can't say uh, up to now we are all we are both working in silos. Uh, the human rights uh, organizations do their their human rights thing and and the link has been uh, usually uh, you need resources to to realize human rights tax is the tool to get resources it was this this mechanical link that we are trying to establish this is not enough it is about linking the two things the, because abuse of human rights and abuse of tax systems happen because of the same fundamental structural and economic uh, fundamentals of a society. So that is where uh, the alignment is necessary. Exchanging analysis, bringing together, uh, you know, it's not in the sense of mainstreaming. Uh, they mainstream tax justice in the human rights movement, whatever it is, and you mainstream human rights in the tax justice movement. This is not the way it has to go. Do we share a common analysis of the fundamental problems that lead to human rights, the, the lack of human rights, and that leads to the lack of the tax, the tax abuses? Uh, does it have to do with, with, with uh, how, or, how society, is or, uh, society and politics is organized? So it is about 
going towards shared analysis of the status quo and shared strategy of having shared strategy of how to overcome this problem. So it has it has to go beyond this uh, very abused term of mainstreaming. It has to be on the basis of shared analysis of of root causes, shared analysis of possible solutions, and joint joint struggles uh, to uh, we are based on. Uh, an aligned strategy. Thank you, and then that brings me on to sort of the to, to some questions relating to the future of the tax justice movement. So first, um, I wanted to ask you. I mean, we, we tend to be uncomfortable with failure, and but I think failure and learning from our failings is where where we can. Um, sort of forge ahead a new path. And I'm just curious to hear from you in your experience as an activist and being part of this movement, committed to this movement over decades, what do you see as some of our greatest failings and what have we learned from them and what do we still need to learn from them as a movement? It, it, might, it might surprise you. For me, for example, the biggest uh, shock I experienced is there was a referendum in the, in the in, in Switzerland where the the draft law was to cut the different the income difference between the rich and the average worker to 12 fold to tax what is above 12 fold so that the difference will not be 12 percent 12 12 fold 1 to 12 60% of the Swiss people voted against this draft. This is, this is far from being uh, egalitarian, 12-fold. But the majority of, and I don't think the majority of Swiss people are beneficiaries of Switzerland as, as, as tax haven. So this is, this, these are the shocks for me. When, when people like Trump get elected despite saying, I'm smart, I cheat. So these are the frustrations. They are not day-to-day, -day part of our day-to-day -day struggles, but this is fundamental. That is, we have not made a breakthrough in making tax, tax a justice issue which should decide elections, which should enable citizens to judge parties according to whether they introduce austerity, whether they bring about policy change to make the poor poorer and the rich richer. So these are these are the setbacks. These are, uh, you know, if, if you get frustrated, then, the, you know, then, then there is no point in going to the struggle. It's not about, about frustration. It is about just saying, we are just beginning. The odds are against us. But unless we have a social, major, a, a, a social majority which favors our questions, which bring, we cannot bring about transformational change. So these are the realities from which we have to start, not to be discouraged, but to know the magnitude of the challenge we are facing. That is why I was trying to say, changing Article 12b is not the issue. It is about having a political majority for the, for the causes of the tax justice movement in, in each society and having a global majority as well, at least a massive support for some of our asks. So <clears throat> we are just beginning really. Uh, and, uh, and those who are, who are, you know, uh, those who are in power who, who defend the status, the status quo, they are powerful, they, you know, it is, uh, you might think there, there is democracy in the north, uh, what? but I think this, it has become very clear that wherever we go, the, the system is more like corporatocracy than democracy. So it is a challenge, uh, and we have to make this as our starting point uh, and not limit our aspirations to just saying, oh, this is not possible to, to crack the system. Let's start by changing some rules down there. So that that is the that that is the reality we have to face. That is really my conviction. Thank you, yeah, Derek. That sort of speaks to one of the R's that you were talking about, representation, and how we really, um, as a movement, 
need to mobilize um, the majority more. And so I have a sort of question coming, like a personal question I'm interested to hear your thoughts on. So um, I'm from Malawi and many people listening today are probably from the global south and we have high tax rates and I'm punitive at times. And, and we also don't necessarily see this funneling into public services. Uh, in the end, we have sort of a privatized state where those who can afford are uh, paying for private education, private healthcare, private security, all sorts of things. Um, and then don't see perhaps the, the need to pay taxes. Like how, how do we mobilize these people, the, the middle class and, and much of the global south? Uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> I know, I know uh, this is a fundamental problem in Africa. I know, uh, and uh, I was once, uh, when I was working at Christian Aid during the uh, Financing for Development co Conference, I was, I was sent to a church leaders meeting uh, to tell them about our global task asks and for them to influence their respective governments uh, to take this position at the U United Nations conference. It was, it was almost unanimous. But after I, I, I finished my, my presentation, almost every bishop was saying, what is the use? Our governments will eat it <laughs> to stop illicit financial flows, or, uh, or to increase the tax take, what is the use? Our government will eat it. So this is a very a serious problem. So my answer to that is really, uh, if we approach it this way, let's first solve the issue of corruption, the issue of abuse of uh, misuse of public revenue, and then come to tax. To If we think about it in this sequential manner, we'll not achieve anything. The best what we can do is to combine both. both. These are the homeworks. On one hand, to increase our pressure on government to be accountable, to use public resources the way it is needed, the way it is appropriate. And on the other hand, also to look at tax dodging, illicit financial flows and what. So that was our effort actually after the creation of Tax Justice Network Africa. We, we had a lot of a lot of uh, civil society budget sponsoring, budget uh, monitoring groups, which were focusing on this eating part of the story, on the corruption, on the misappropriation and what. So it was about just combining our, our struggles. On one hand, to forge accountable governments uh, and that public resources are used for as they are meant to be, but at simultaneously also to increase the pressure on, uh, to increase also the struggle to stop tax dodging and to, to stop uh, illicit financial flows. So one after the other will not stop any, both of them, but combining the two efforts is the only way we can move about it. Uh, the frustration is really strong and uh, that, that, is, that, that, that is for sure, but uh, it is not a sequential thing. It has to be done simultaneously. Thanks, Derek. And to pick up a couple more questions from our audience, speak to what you've just, um, your thoughts on this. So Andres Arroz, the guy in ask, can you talk a bit more about the role of media for mobilizing um, the social majority? So uh, media is also not a homogeneous group. Uh, there are those who serve uh, the status quo, and there are there are also those uh, <coughs> those who are also critical. And uh, uh, th there has been really a good beginning in this area. We had we with the small collaboration we had with mid with some media houses and what. Uh, there, there is there, there, the, compared to, compared to ten years ago, for example, really having critical journalists coming to us to know our perspectives, giving us space to debate some issues on, on national television and what. So it is, it is very important because uh, in a way, uh, you know, critical journalism is part of, uh, part of the, the key influencers of public opinion. So uh, 
But knowing that there are powerful media, media outlets which are in, on the other side, we have also to cultivate and nurture uh, relationship with alternative, you know, critical journalists and, and get our stories over there. It's, it is really, it's, uh, it's, this is a very, you know, an, uh, an initial phase of collaboration, but it is really uh, encouraging what I've seen in Africa happening in this area, for example. At every conference uh, TGNA might organize, be it Pan-African or, or regional, there are always elements of the journalists who come who come and ask what our perspectives are on these issues, who carry such, such stories. And it has helped us more than our own publications. Such media presence has helped us also to, to, change, to send out our message. Uh, for example, uh, one of the success stories of TGNA would not have been possible without media support. Uh, it's litigation with the government of Kenya on the signing of the double taxation agreement with Mauritius. Uh, it became a court case and it was widely covered by the Kenyan media and it has it has helped it also raise you know uh, it is about uh, this profile is benefiting TGNA also to intervene on, on on similar issues also in the future so it was a big success uh, it, it was a neglected part of our work but now I think we are catching up and there are some important relations being built I was uh, Russian, I was hoping that some will comment. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, let me take a look. I don't, I don't see any comments, but let me take a look in the in the chat. And while I'm doing that, I've been told that we need to wrap up very soon. So, Derajay, may I just allow ask you to to reflect now on the one or two things? Probably it's quite hard to focus on one that you want to see your what you that where you're going to pull your energies over the next. Um, over the next decade as you fight towards um, a juster society through tax justice and more. So uh, the, the first thing really is, uh, as I said, it was not to open wounds or to to settle account that I mentioned the original uh, difficulties we had within the movement. This uh, dichotomy between expertise and tax justice movement. We have to carefully manage this. We have to eliminate paternalism, that is good, that is for sure. But also, you know, I, I'm not ashamed of saying there is, there is a huge policy knowledge gap between the North and the South. And I, I'm not, you know, I don't have a nationalism which says you cannot learn from anywhere else except in Africa. I, I did all my studies in Germany. So it is not about that, but it is about really how to work together to make the knowledge and expertise fruitful to the struggles in the South without having this take or leave it. This is what you should do attitude. That is the most important thing. And the second one is really to, to coordinate, uh, to make the research, the policy analysis as relevant as possible to the issues and concerns of developing countries in, co in collaboration with activists, with, with, with research institutions and what. So, uh, it needs. It is about about building and nurturing solidarity. It is not about encapsulating ourselves. The humanity is one. It's not about that. It is about eliminating the relationship of domination uh, within within a movement. It is building solidarity and understanding within a movement. It is not about splitting it in north and south. So that is. <clears throat> these are really the most important things. And what do they say? Why do they say this? We have to try to understand instead of saying, here is the solution, run with it. So uh, that, that is really what I, how I want to conclude. And thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And uh, thank you very much, Rachel, also for the introduction. Thank you so much, Derek. And there's been a few more questions and comments in the, on swap cards. I hope you can take a look and maybe continue the discussion after this. So, um, oh no, I'm back with a yet another rhyme. Defeating the predominant neoliberal paradigm is a call made by Dr. Derge. I hope with this that you will move in a more radical way. Thank you so much for your attention. As I mentioned, there will be several revelations, indeed quoting Marx, shall hopefully spark a change in your thought or way of doing. 
following the path of climate justice activists to make sure the tax reforms in the right way do twist, linking not mainstreaming human rights and tax justice through a common analysis of the origins of abuse and injustice. Derege, thank you so much for your provocative words. You have been heard. Thank you for your lifelong commitment to social transformation and using passion, intellect, grit, and the right information. You inspire me with your boldness and your decades of resistance. Thank you, attentive audience. Let's stick around to recognize those who broke new ground for coming next so you know what to expect. It's a ceremony of the Anderson Lucas Norman Award for Tax Justice Heroism. Keep well, keep the fight. From Malawi, good night. Thank you.